Okay, I think it's fine. So she doesn't say. I see we have many people coming in, so I think we can uh, we can be prompt and start at 501, but it looks like folks are still coming in. Either way, Roxana. Catherine, you, you tell me, somebody do a, a sign for me, just raise your, and I'll start whenever it's appropriate. I think, let's get going. We reward the folks that are able to be prompt with us. Okay. Wonderful. Good evening. I'm Roxana Velasquez, the Maruca Baldwin Executive Director and CEO of the San Diego Museum of Art. I am truly pleased to welcome you all to the 21st Annual AxeLine Lecture. It's a true pleasure to be here tonight virtually with the Museum of Contemporary Art for another AxeLine presentation. On behalf of the San Diego Museum of Art, Board of Trustees, staff and members, thank you. Thank you for hosting this year's event. This lecture honors great benefactors, Jackie and Rhea Axline, whose 1999 bequest continues to strengthen and impact each of our museums, collections and exhibitions, as well as our, our education programs and community outreach. To honor their memory and legacy, we have jointly presented the Axline Lecture since the year 2000. Critics, artists, and lecturers of the highest caliber have been our special guests, including Chilean artist and architect and filmmaker Alfredo Ja, as well as photographer Catherine Opie, painter and sculptor Nancy Lawrence, and the artist Trevor Paglin, whose work blurs the line between art, science, and investigative journalism. Most recently, in 2020, we hosted the Madrid-based multidisciplinary artist, Ana de Aldea, whose exhibition, Everything You See Could Be a Lie, will open very soon at the San Diego Museum of Art. I'm excited for tonight's lecture from Annabelle Seldorf, the internationally acclaimed architect whose design of the Museum of Contemporary Arts flagship building will no doubt transform San Diego. The Axline Lecture is a perfect example of the importance and prevalence of art in San Diego. It is essential to continue to invest in these opportunities to ignite dialogues through art and to make art more accessible for individuals from all backgrounds to see themselves reflected in art and be encouraged to tell their own stories. These extraordinary art experiences with world-renowned artists will not be possible without the support of individuals like each one of you tonight. On behalf of the San Diego Museum of Art Board of Trustees, thank you again for being part of this wonderful tradition. Now, it is my great honor and pleasure to introduce the David Copley Director and CEO of the Museum of Contemporary Art, my esteemed colleague and dear friend, Catherine Canton. Roxana, thank you. It's, um, it's always such a pleasure, this annual marker of when we get to um, present the Axline Lecture. It's anticipated for the community because of the lecturer, but I, I always just enjoy the partnership of our two organizations coming together. Um, and I do want to acknowledge the leadership of our museums and particularly to thank MCASD's board president, Paul Jacobs, and of course, the San Diego Museum of Art board president, Taffin Ann Ray. Um, and like Roxana, I also want to thank, thank the members of our institutions because you do help sustain us in our ongoing operation through your membership. Uh, you help us deliver the exhibitions um, and programs, uh, not just to you, but to an even broader public. So, so thank you for your support. And if you're not a member, we, we, we need you now more than ever, I invite you to join. 
Um, we do also receive institutional support um, in part from the city of San Diego, the Commission of Arts and Culture. Um, and now just a, a couple of housekeeping. This is a Zoom webinar. So to make this presentation work, um, once Annabelle starts speaking, you can select the side-by-side -side mode to be able to see just her and her presentation. At the top of your screen, you can select the drop down menu, view options, and then you would choose side by side mode. You can also hover your pointer over the boundary between the shared screen participants um, until it changes to an arrow. And then you can, you can move it either way to either make Annabelle's image bigger or her, um, or her images bigger. At the end, we will take um, questions, but written in the, the Q&A function, which is at the bottom of your screen. So please um, write those uh, along the way. We, we may be limited. I don't know that we can answer them all, um, but we will, we will do our best. Um, so what a pleasure for me right now, I get to introduce uh, tonight's uh, acclaimed speaker, uh, internationally known and regarded architect, Annabelle Seldorf. Um, Annabelle, Annabelle is the lead architect, as, as Roxana was saying, the lead architect on the expansion of MCASD's flagship location in La Jolla. So that's, we think that's the biggest claim to fame, but of course she does more than that. <laughs> she is the principal of Seldorf Architects. This is a firm that was, she established, it, established in 1988. Today it numbers 65 um, staff members and they have worked on both public and private projects, uh, residential, commercial, and cultural, so often cultural. Her projects range from the compressed earth classrooms of a school in Southern Zambia to a municipal recycling facility in Brooklyn, from discrete residences to very public museums such as ours. And she works uh, both uh, with construction of new buildings, ground up, but also quite sensitively with um, historical renovations to historical structures and interiors. And she also does exhibition design. At MCASD, she's doing a bit of all of that, um, working with our architectural legacy, Gill, Mosier, and Venturi. She's repurposing existing spaces. And as you will see, she's adding gracious new galleries and public amenities. And in all of that work for whichever the client, she brings forward a purposeful sense of space and a kind of modern clarity. Um, the firm's clients, because there are other clients besides San Diego, um, include cultural institutions that you know, such as the Noya Gallery in New York and the Luma, in Luma Foundation in Arles. More recently, as you've seen in the news, she is working with the Frick Collection, the Smithsonian American Art Museum, the Hispanic Society Museum and Library, and also the Clark Institute in Williamsburg. Uh, the firm has also created numerous uh, gallery spaces for quite notable galleries, David Zwerner, Hauser and Wirth, Gladstone, among others. And then for her exhibition design work, she's, she's designed shows for the Whitney Museum, for Freeze Masters, for Gagosian Galleries, and the Venice Art Biennial. Uh, born and raised in Cologne, Germany, Annabelle did receive her Bachelor of Architecture in the States at Pratt Institute, and then her Master of Architecture from Syracuse University. She is celebrated as a fellow of the American Institute of Architects. She serves on the board of the Architectural Lead of New York, the World Monuments Fund, Chinati Foundation, the Center for Curatorial Studies at Bard College, and she's taught um, at Harvard, uh, at Bard, I think, and also at Harvard Graduate uh, School of Design. She is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Letters. She's also the recipient of the 2016 Medal of Honor from the American Institute of Architects, New York chapter, and she is our architect. So without further ado, I want to welcome Annabelle Seldorf. Hi, thank you. Thank you, Catherine. <clears throat> That's incredibly nice. Uh, it sounded a little bit intimidating. Still a year in um, speaking to an audience that you cannot see is a little bit intimidating. Nevertheless, I'm incredibly honored that you've invited me to this lecture. And um, I thought that 
it would be really um, the simplest thing to tell you a little bit about what we do. Because while Catherine has, has given such a nice uh, history of the office, it doesn't say enough about how, what a fantastic place the office is. And um, I'm very happy to take all of the credit, but of course it goes to all of us who work together in the office. And as Catherine has said, um, there are some 65 of us today and here is a directional sign to our office at 860 Broadway on Union Square. <clears throat> I don't uh, really have much of a habit of um, advancing the slides because I have a tendency to speak too much. So I'm going to try and keep a pace with myself and not bore you to tears. Um, but wait, why is it not advancing? Here it is. Here is that office at 860 Broadway on Union Square in days when everybody worked together. We have our office, a collaborative space in an incredibly beautiful loft uh, looking south over Union Square, just a floor below Andy Warhol's former factory. And I'd like to think that we're terribly inspired by Warhol's uh, thinking and ideas, but maybe really more by our own method of working, of working together, listening closely to, to the ideas and needs that our clients put forth. And I hope that in the following uh, images, I can tell you a little bit that our work process is really one that is fueled by specificity, uh, making each project very different from one another, but perhaps guided by some of the same motivation that is to make places for people. This is one of the first art projects I ever did in 1990. Uh, when I had just barely started the office and I was pretty much a lone practitioner, um, we were, at that point I was, commissioned by Michael Werner Gallery um, to design a gallery on the Upper East Side of New York. Michael Werner, of course, was a famed uh, gallerist from Cologne, Germany. Um, and since I am from Cologne, as probably you've detected an accent, uh, I was. it seemed very normal that he would hire an architect from the same town. Needless to say, I was really very young. I hadn't done any projects of any, of any note. And um, so I put my be all and end all uh, into, into making a gallery that was really rather small, some 1800 square feet as it were. Um, but every last little detail went into thinking about how would you be looking at art? How would you be entering? How would you be received? How would you, uh, what would your encounter with art be like? And this is what it looked like. It took some eight months to build this little gallery, but to this day, I sort of cherish every detail, the floor materials, the way uh, daylight interacted with, uh, with the exhibition spaces, the kind of flexibility that we were able to offer uh, to show both sculpture as well as paintings, um, a kind of intimate space, but one that was well appointed and never overwrought uh, the experience of looking at art. Just a small room, um, but I still love those glass doors that separate the exhibition space, one exhibition space, one exhibition space that was maybe 800 square feet, if that much, um, but it was very, very special indeed. 
And here is a photo of the Neue Galerie, a museum for German and Austrian art on 86th Street and Fifth Avenue um, that we were hired to renovate um, in the late 90s, shall I say. <laughs> um, it's a wonderful building. It's a building that was built in 1914 by Carrere and Hastings for a private residence of, of a local merchant. And eventually this building went through a, a variety of different proprietors only to end as being the Evo Institute for Jewish History um, before Serge Sabarsky, an art dealer from Vienna, purchased the building to turn it into a museum. He died before he could do that. And Ronald Lauder um, purchased the building from the estate. He was a very close friend of Serge Sabarsky's and decided to make it a museum for German and Austrian art. The art that isn't very well represented in other museums in and around the city. And so when I was hired to do this first public building uh, that I ever worked on, I was, to say the least, very excited, but also quite worried because there were lots of things that I didn't know about, that we as a team didn't know about. It was a marvelous collaboration uh, with Renee Price, who still is the director of the museum today, um, and some of the curators who are, continue to contribute to put together not only an exhibition program, but sort of a program for a new institution. What is it like to build or rather to create a museum in a city that is full of museums? Um, well, we had to sort of piece it together because we didn't know how many people were going to want to come. Um, there were 25,000 square feet available, of which only uh, the, the first and second floor, or rather the second and third floor, uh, were going to be devoted to exhibition. Suffice it to say that in the architecture of Carrera and Hastings, there were some beautiful spaces that were more restored rather than uh, renovated or or created anew um, and the entire outlook on the building was to understand that a building that was built in 1916 sort of coincided with a period of of beginning modernism in in the art in the german-speaking world uh, of Europe. What is being shown in this museum is, is art up to 1945, from the early 20th century onward. And the, the contemporaneity of the, of the, of the building itself, uh, confronting sort of rather provocative uh, ways of thinking about art is something that never ceases to, to produce an electrifying effect. So as I said, a good part of our work here was to restore the existing building. We rebuilt the skylight that you see in this picture, um, fixed an old library into a bookstore, uh, created a Viennese cafe and made some really marvelous exhibition spaces where there was prior to that a uh, kind of music room. And how do you turn a residential building into a museum? Oftentimes the Neue Galerie is called a house museum, though it's not truly uh, a house museum. It's not suggesting that these rooms were used for something other than looking at art. And it's a very fine line and working together with Ronald Lauder and uh, Renee Price was a marvelous experience because there was constant exchange about how do you look at art? How do you look at this particular art? And how do you 
put it into the context of New York, but also into the context of where the art came from. Here, for example, is a panel room that apparently was a dining room at one time, and we've uh, created these, these vitrines uh, that were originally from the Victoria and Albert Museum in London, um, but sort of fitted the time of this building and showcased beautifully uh, the marvelous decorative arts of Joseph Hoffman and others. But we were also at the same time able to introduce sophisticated uh, museum quality lighting and, and climate controls. And that, as you can imagine, wasn't at all easy because it had to be done in such a way that it appeared everything but inevitable. Today, the museum is very much part of the museum landscape not a big museum, it continues to produce these really incredibly sophisticated and, and informative exhibitions that uh, delight people and uh, when they're not delighted by the exhibitions, for sure, finding the Viennese cakes in the cafe makes up for any deficiencies. A little while later in the Chelsea Arts District, um, we were commissioned by David Zwerner, an old friend, um, a friend of many years and a client uh, to this day. Uh, David commissioned us to build a new building on 20th Street. We had already worked with him on a number of galleries, but um, at some point he purchased a property and realized that the existing building wasn't suited to be renovated for, for gallery purposes. So uh, we demolished an existing building and designed a new building uh, made with, uh, with, with all uh, board form concrete. And you see that facade here, you recognize that it is in the same street front. It is a building that is different from other buildings surrounding it. Um, what makes it special is that it is very much purpose-built. And what you see in this diagram is a large space that is the heart of the building, a, an 80 by 80 foot gallery with 18 foot high ceilings and tall north facing skylights. Uh, this really makes the main space of the gallery. The building is entirely functional. Everything uh, is located in an L shape around the main space, double story, tall gallery space, and the remainder of the building is some five floors tall. Um, and it talks about the construction, but at the same time, everything is dedicated to being entirely functional, to being the first sustainable um, lead gold building for of a commercial art gallery. There's plenty of daylight, there are efficient HVAC, uh, HVAC climate controls, um, there is green roofs, there is cross ventilation, and it was really an exercise in making a place that all around not only delighted in the viewing of art, but made it a place for people to work and uh, a, a healthy uh, place that in my mind uh, simply makes sense. The board form concrete is something uh, that is really interesting because it's actually quite difficult to produce. We had to learn a great deal about uh, what goes into the dough of a concrete mix. It had to be just very precisely and very specifically put together so that the five or six concrete pours, uh, one after the other, looked very much the same. 
We also wanted the reading of the board form. What that means is you're reading the horizontal lines of wood boards that hold the concrete in place as it cures. That surface, that texture of this rather, rather industrial material is offset by these beautiful, very uh, finely detailed teak windows that uh, rise across the facade and a very inviting open uh, wood storefront that, that welcomes visitors into the, into the gallery proper. We wanted to be sure that the building tectonically really makes sense. And we wanted to express that concrete is the actual structural material that constitutes the, the authentic uh, reality of the building. And we poured a great deal of effort into expressing that in this five-story staircase that is um, flooded with daylight from a sky skylight above and that sort of really creates a vertical uh, channel through the building and is very um, visible at the ground floor. And of course, at the top floor looking down is rather remarkable. However, it stands back and is sort of rather low key relative to the magnificent main space that in some ways, was designed with the idea that large sculpture uh, could be the main player in the room. Um, when Richard Serra uh, opened his show in, I can't remember exactly when it was, it's a few years ago, um, and he created these incredible sculptures for this exhibition space. I can't say how incredibly humbled I felt when he sort of patted me on the shoulder and said, good space this. That was a little bit like a gold medal or something. But here you see the same space in a different application. It is really a space that people can enjoy and uh, can be used in, in a variety of different layouts to create different kinds of exhibitions. Um, the daylight is so clear and plain and strong and calm um, that it almost doesn't require electrical light. Here, this is with the Kusama show. And I like the kind of difference uh, of, of exhibitions. I always think that a good space invites very different applications and and we'll talk a little bit more about that later on here are some more images these are some of the uh, viewing rooms further up the building uh, here with side light <laughs> it's also a place for people uh, some 60 or so people work in the building and they come together and have lunch together in the library and, and there is a proper kitchen where people can, can be together. Now, back to Europe. Don't know that we've been there before, but here we are in Europe. We're in, this, in the south of France, in Luma, in looking at Luma Arles in Arles, in the south of France. And what you see in this image to the left is a sort of tall, building, um, which in this next image, you can identify as the eponymous Frank Gehry design uh, for, for the foundation. Some six, seven years ago, Maya Hoffman, who is the, the founder of Luma Arl, uh, invited us to participate in, in a project that involved a great many uh, constituents. We were in charge of making, um, repurposing the existing buildings. They had once upon a time been serving uh, the SNCF French rail railroads uh, as an industrial facility to build rail cars and the like. So they're all together five or six buildings that were 
that we were able to repurpose over time and make turn into exhibition space and and rehearsal space and even uh, even uh, a, a dormitory. So what was fascinating was that these early 20th century buildings had a kind of serial quality to them, but very simple, very clear, very beautiful uh, rendition of daylight. And so we tried to do just as little as was possible. And in this particular building that you're seeing here, which is called the Mécanique, um, we simply made very large exhibition spaces, uh, reducing uh, the structure to the extent possible and creating with one small addition, that black box that you see there that sort of mirrors uh, the serial quality, but um, expresses itself in a slightly, uh, with a slightly different presence. Um, we were able to create space that was double wide, in other words, 20 meters of column free space. Uh, on the outside, uh, here in this, in this sort of pre-moment, this facility is still going under uh, a great deal of work to, for all of the landscaping that is going to happen. And so you're seeing this here just after construction was finished. Um, it's a very simple building, reduced to just the very basic elements of creating uh, an envelope that mirrors the historical facade. But on the inside, it has this very clear, simple, large space available for all kinds of different layouts and all kinds of different activities. Um, this is a Gilbert and George show that happened a few years ago, and you can see how how easy it is to to make partitions and and create a very very flexible um, layout for different kinds of exhibitions. In other areas of of the foundation, there are open courtyards and uh, multiple elements that all are about bringing people together. South of France is never a bad place to be for sure, uh, but Luma in particular has a kind of generosity at heart uh, that is, I think, supported by the architecture and hopefully by what we did, um, but sort of has, has come to have a spirit of its own. And to say that we collaborated with Frank Gehry is maybe pushing it a little bit. Frank Gehry uh, built his tower, but we were in constant dialogue and sort of supportive of our, our uh, different, different attitudes to building. Um, our Seldorf architects uh, task was to repurpose the existing buildings and make the most of it uh, having flexible space, but also reminding people of a kind of context and history that exists in this area. So um, it gives me a great deal of pleasure that over time we, we completed all these different buildings. Here you're looking at the uh, refectoire, the former refectory that was uh, rebuilt to become a rehearsal uh, studio. Dance and all kinds of per performances happen in this building. And we literally rebuilt uh, the, the building the way it once was and turned it into, into a rehearsal space that can also accommodate some 200 people in the, uh, as, as, visitors or, or um, as an audience. And on the lower floor, on the other hand, because there were very tall spaces, we were able to create a kind of house within a house using um, cross laminated timber construction and making a two-story dormitory 
that represents literally just the first floor. And so there's a kind of interesting uh, conversation going on between something that is a semi-domestic space, something that's very human, that's very modern, that's very simple and free uh, to, the, to the dedicated spaces to, to dance performance and, and other performances. Sometimes uh, when there are seminars or, or something that's called the Luma days, people, lecturers and, and panelists will stay in the dormitory and, uh, and utilize the entire foundation as a way to, to communicate with one another about the important topics that go on in the world of art and in the world of social justice and, and uh, climate crisis. We also have done a number of residential projects. And so here quickly, I wanted to show a house that we recently completed in Westchester. It's not a huge house, but it's an intense house. It's an intense house uh, for a family of art collectors. And they came to us after we had worked with them on another small project and they very much wanted a house in the country, just as long as the bugs were kept out, um, but a house that's entirely dedicated where every wall is, is devoted to looking and, uh, and exhibiting art. And it was really a lot of fun to, to work with this family. There is a very simple floor plan. And on the upper right hand corner, you can see three rooms that are the so-called gallery rooms. It seemed odd at first to have uh, rooms that are really only there for art in a private house, um, but we rather liked that there was such passion for art uh, that somebody could say, you know, people have laundries, they have kitchens, they have bathrooms, and they have rooms for art. And uh, so that was, was the mission of the building. And uh, these are just little illustrations to sort of say, um, there's room for everyone here. And, um, and it was fun to do. And it was fun to be part of the conversation, to incorporate art, to think about daylight, to think about the proportions, to think about materiality in such a way that uh, you would never take away from the experience of looking at art, but at the same time, also not take away from the experience of being at home and being in a sort of intimate environment where people interact with the art. I have always felt that this family um, was, was a gift to me because I felt that I could learn from their passion and their devotion of, and courage really of looking at such a diverse and such, an, such a provocative collection. Um, and I sort of feel like I was lucky to have that opportunity to, to learn and to create space uh, that is in constant conversation with, with these works of art. It's kind of a beautiful uh, little site and we were lucky to be there. Um, earlier, Catherine mentioned a project that we completed a few years ago it's the Sunset Park Material Recovery Facility. What it is, is a recycling facility, one that is really rather progressive for uh, recycling facilities in America. It was supported by Mayor Bloomberg as one of the working uh, industrial facilities in, on the working waterfront in Brooklyn in Sunset Park to be specific. It's located on a pier. And the organization of this facility, um, we were hired as a result of a small competition at a moment in time when designing recycling facilities wasn't 
exactly the fashionable thing to do. But we were thrilled to be considered for the project because we felt that doing such a project meant something uh, where architecture con could contribute on an infrastructural scale and taught us to understand what the circumstances are in which people on an industrial scale work. And we tried out things that we had uh, looked at and thought about in terms of scale, uh, human scale to be specific, on a bigger scale and translate the ideas that have to do with how do people use space onto something uh, that is in some ways much more challenging. So here, what you see on this pier uh, is a series of building blocks, so to speak, that were all pre-engineered buildings, but had specific um, architectural articulation, creating a series of courtyards, creating a kind of entrance sequence along the northern edge of the, of the pier, all of which are designed to understand the procession and the experience and the real vitality of the recycling process. Here, you're looking uh, at the water side of the so-called tipping building. It, con it includes a roof where barges can uh, arrive and load or unload recyclables. This is the other side of the same tipping building where we um, articulated the, the uh, vertical supports on the outside of the building so as to give it scale and to make it something that is altogether more understandable in terms of dimension. And to the left hand, you're seeing a little bridge. And that bridge was very important because it uh, leads from an education center to looking into this space where all these recyclables are moved about. In this particular picture, you're seeing it from the barge side. Um, and here is a picture of the so-called processing building where recyclables are, are sorted and uh, eventually bailed in what's called the bailing building. But a very important part of this, uh, of this facility was the educational component of it. From the get-go, Sims Metal Management, the operator of this facility who is working in partnership with the uh, New York City Sanitation Department was devoted to having an educational component. And every day there are um, many, many buses with full of, of school children coming to learn and understand about the, the importance of recycling and, and understand and learn about the different material qualities. Surely you've heard about uh, how to uh, distinguish between plastics. Well, I hope next time when you're in New York City, you're going to come and visit this facility because uh, there is, is much more to learn about. And here uh, you see this, this photo that sort of articulates very nicely the kind of vertical element in the smaller education building to the taller uh, proportion of the, of the tipping building. And here looking into, into the space, children always being fascinated with uh, the noise and the smell of it all. A project that's particularly dear to me is a school, um, it is a kind of not-for-profit uh, project that we did for the Plus 14 Foundation in uh, Mabwindo in Zambia. A friend spearheaded uh, the Plus 14 Foundation and when he asked me if I'd be interested in helping to design um, a school in Mabwindo, 
I was very excited about it. I sent an email to everybody in the office and I was incredibly happy to, to realize that everybody, virtually everybody in the office wanted to participate in the design and in the bringing together the school. And so in some ways I feel that um, designing the school did just uh, something really beautiful for the community that I call our office. And, um, and seeing today that the school is actually completed is, is very gratifying. It's a composition really of uh, classrooms that sit under a shade tent roof. Uh, there are some administrative facilities and, uh, and then an overall design that incorporates teachers housing, community gardens, uh, a big soccer field uh, in a very, very plain landscape where children live that are very, not only poor, but also far away uh, from, from schools and any kind of infrastructure that would provide safety for them. So building this school meant that we were building something uh, in a very simple environment. And so we used um, compression brick that is made of the, of the local earth. And local people were able to learn the technique of making this brick, building these very simple buildings um, with these large, simple uh, steel truss supported uh, roof structures that provide uh, shelter from, from the monsoon rains, but also from the intense sun and uh, have lots of open space that serves the children, but ultimately also serves the community. And it was really a very moving experience to see uh, how much of a difference have creating the school made um, to, to the people in the local community and um, visiting there and learning from them, understanding how they teach and how they live uh, was one of the more, more moving experiences for us. Uh, we used all kinds of techniques to get uh, cross ventilation into the classrooms, but also into the hallways, uh, have shading techniques um, and, and the like, but keep it all very simple and very basic, and yet uh, very much about the activities of the children. Catherine already mentioned that we are currently working on a renovation and expansion for the Frick Collection in New York, um, which is a very important project. People care about this building perhaps more than they care about many buildings in New York. And so we were greeted with a great deal of scrutiny when it was announced that we were working on this project. And in particular, because uh, change is difficult to fathom. So the Frick collection started out as a private mansion for Henry Clay Frick. Uh, he built it for him and his family coming from Pittsburgh in uh, 1914. Henry Clay Frick hired Thomas Hastings of Career and Hastings, the same architects who incidentally uh, were the architects of the Neue Galerie. And he built this building with an idea in mind that at one point after his death, um, it could become a museum. He was an avid art collector. Uh, he had amassed by the time of his death, one of the finest collections of old master paintings and decorative arts. So this uh, axonometric shows you quickly and sort of in the appropriate colors that the original building, all that which is light yellow, was built by the time that Henry uh, 
Henry Clay Frick died in 1919, so the building was completed in 1914. Um, upon the, the death of his wife, uh, John Russell Pope was hired to convert the building into a museum. Um, he not only converted the building into a museum by changing the entrance, but also added a library replacing an earlier library that had been built in 1924. And you see that in the sort of slightly uh, brighter yellow. Not until much later in 1941, uh, the Frick trustees had purchased a number of townhouses and excavated under the first easternmost townhouse, three stories down uh, for an addition of a vault to, to safeguard uh, the art in case that needed doing. Finally, in 1977, uh, the Frick decided that their ideas of expansion had to be curtailed and they uh, decided to only build a relatively small reception hall so as to alleviate the difficulties of receiving the ever increasing numbers of visitors. And they commissioned uh, uh, Russell Russell Page, an English landscape designer, to design a garden on 70th Street. Uh, I don't know if you can see my cursor, I hope you can. Um, a very simple garden that was only visible from the street and visible from the reception uh, hall, but never accessible from, from, from there. So, in 2020, our proposal is to add all that which you see lightly added, uh, shaded in gray. It's a very modest renovation and one that is really mostly, if not exclusively dedicated to the visitor's experience. Oh, wrong direction. The visitor's experience today is limited to the ground floor and everybody who has been to the museum has always wondered what is going on up the stairs on the second floor. Well, that is one of the great privileges that we'll be able to provide for visitors is to make the second floor accessible. And, um, and the entire scheme really is about uh, may, adding this new exhibition space, uh, but also understanding circulation all around that experience. <clears throat> In this uh, rendering, you see that the existing building remains completely intact and untouched. And to the back, to the rear of the, of the library, there is the small addition that is really just one or two rooms thick. Um, adding uh, mostly mostly um, sort of back of house and and uh, visitor amenities. So in this floor plan quickly, uh, all that which is red is dedicated to the gallery space and remains completely untouched except for restored skylights and and minor improvements. The sort of lighter pink is an improved reception hall and visitor centers and new areas dedicated to education and study center. Right in the thick of it all, uh, that which is orange is going to be special exhibitions that link harmoniously and in a very simple way, the existing uh, loop around the around the old house, around the mansion, as it were, uh, to a relatively small special exhibition space. But perhaps most importantly, what our renovation expansion does, it sort of creates a circulation through the expanded lobby up and across to the old building, making the building entirely accessible. 
were taking advantage of the three-story vault that I mentioned earlier by restoring the garden and putting an auditorium underneath the garden. And that, of course, is going to be very exciting because it kind of makes a very simple link across the building uh, that makes all of the spaces accessible and much, much more comfortable than they are today. And here is a small image of the of the expanded reception hall, expanded only from within by creating a single uh, space that was formerly divided and, and uh, uh, had a circular stair in the middle and a small bookstore in the um, in the way. Here is an image of the of the special exhibitions. And finally, a view from 70th Street uh, that illustrates the uh, the opportunity that I think is really sort of at the heart of of this renovation. We kept the Russell Page Garden just exactly what it was. It will forever remain a tableau garden, but by adding a second level on top of the reception hall, um, the view of the garden, both from the reception hall, as well as from a small cafe on the second floor, as well as from uh, these upper rooms, is going to illustrate to people on the street, but also from within, that the garden has literally become the sort of nexus of breaking open uh, what was previously a very closed and very reticent uh, Beaux-Arts building. I'm very excited that in subtle ways we are, I am convinced, achieving something that is much, much more open and much, much more welcoming to a much more diverse uh, group of visitors and yet retaining a kind of intimacy and, and special quality um, that few museums have been able to hold on to over time. And um, so just wait for a little while and then you can come and see it. And while you wait to come and see it, uh, you have an opportunity to go visit Frick Madison um, in what at one time was the Whitney Museum and then became uh, the Met Breuer and today is called Frick Madison. Uh, the Frick Collection had the opportunity to, to take over this marvelous building by Marcel Breuer uh, for a few years while they're undergoing the renovation. And we were very happy to be part and parcel of turning uh, this modernist icon into a space um, and creating galleries uh, that do justice to the beautiful collection of the Frick. And here you see just a few images of, uh, of what the collection looks like here. Um, I could talk about this for rather too long, but since that is my habit, I will only just take you through some of these images to, to say that showing the collection in such a different context, not in, in the marvelous mansion by Thomas Hastings and John Russell Pope, uh, but here in the context of a, of a modernist super icon uh, was a really interesting experience because creating these exhibition spaces um, was not altogether obvious. And we worked closely with the, with the curators to understand how they wanted uh, the collection be shown. In this particular case, it's much, much more museal, whereas in the uh, mansion, you're looking at the collection relative to 
domestic spaces with uh, decorative arts. Here, there is a much more purist chronological and, and um, geographical uh, organization. And um, when you visit the exhibition today, you feel whether you have seen the collection before or not, that you're seeing it in a completely new context. And for me, it's very exciting to think that old master paintings can be vibrant and in conversation um, with, with truly beautiful architecture. And I'm happy to think that we've contributed just a little bit to making that experience very rich and very rewarding. Here you're looking at one of, um, one of the most amazing paintings in the world, um, a Bellini painting looking out the window out um, to a 1950s white brick building. Go figure. I'll close that uh, with the, um, with Jean Barbet's angel. And on every floor, as you come off the elevator, uh, there is a kind of welcome by small elements of sculpture that introduce uh, the world that you are about to enter. And every time that I look at this image, I sort of think um, that this is a fantastic opportunity to, to allow these objects to speak to us and to make a connection across time and hopefully forward. But now, I want to talk to you a little bit about the Museum of Contemporary Art in San Diego, La Jolla. And what you're seeing here, of course, is the original building, that which eventually became MCASD, um, a building by uh, Irving Gill, built in 1916. I would say that this is a proto-modern building and uh, Irving Gill, of course, was an absolutely wonderful, sensitive architect whose sort of devotion to making clear, simple, sincere spaces um, was never... He was, was forever unwavering. And uh, so he built this building for Ellen Browning Scripps in 1916, uh, very much thinking about, about the climate, about the place, about the community. And uh, when she died, she left the building to the Arts Club, uh, which opened in 1941. And from there on, the building uh, underwent many a change uh, through multiple architects. Several renovations happened with Mosher Drew from San Diego, and eventually in the late 90s, Maturi Scott Brown undertook uh, a significant renovation, one uh, that we will continue to celebrate. And in fact, the lecture tonight is devoted uh, and called the Axe Line uh, Lecture. So, here already you're seeing a kind of composite of, of old and new elements. The, um, the former concert hall in, on the left-hand side, the Irving Gill building, which Venturi Scott Brown uh, lovingly renovated uh, with the restaurant on the right-hand side and, and a sort of um, free space to axe line um, on the on the left hand side. When the museum acquired a new piece of land to the south of the former uh, Sherwood Hall, um, they looked to hire an architect who would add significant more gallery space. And lucky us, we were the ones chosen um, to embark on this task. 
and over time and utilizing sort of very careful uh, ways of thinking about it, we created a geometry that would marry these different parts. In my mind, this building is about bringing art to people, about opening to the fantastic views, about inviting the town to, to be welcome in this building and uh, to honor and do justice to the different periods of time in which the museum developed. We're celebrating the magnificent Irving Gill building. Um, we're looking at the Venturi Scott Brown Axe Line Court. Um, we're repurposing and utilizing Sherwood Hall to uh, be a grand gallery space in really phenomenal scale. And we are enveloping that southern end of the building with a series of gallery spaces that uh, follow the topography down to, to the coast. And in so doing, I think we'll be able to engage all of the spaces, all of uh, the time, uh, both in contact with the the fantastic views out to the ocean, but also taking advantage of the beautiful Southern California light and in a grand loop, engaging all of the spaces, making, um, making a kind of grand tour of, of different scaled spaces um, to do justice to the collection, but also uh, to really um, be inviting to the community and providing services that go beyond just museum exhibitions, having educational programs um, and, and a lot more. And so here are some renderings, but today I must say I'm particularly thrilled because um, my, my colleagues from the office, my partner, Sarah Lopergolo and project manager, uh, Rio G. Karuba are in San Diego today. And I all day long got these text messages saying, it's so beautiful, it's happening, the spaces are great and um, I, cannot wait to come back to San Diego and um, see it all for myself. So these are some images of the construction in progress. And I think um, between renderings of the, of the entrance spaces and other spaces that you're seeing now and seeing um, construction underway, I hope that you can understand how excited I am to see this come to, to, into life and also um, seeing this as a really incredible opportunity for, for La Jolla and San Diego. This is of course um, the repurposed space, very tall ceiling heights, uh, skylights on the left and connections um, that go all around the, the building. I just cannot begin to say how, how thrilling it is for me to see how the different geometries that were really very complicated to, um, to marry into simple logical cogent places that never feel like they're anything but in the service of art and but in the service of of an agreeable and understandable uh, circulation how they sort of come into having a very very calm and very logical presence eventually if you are a seagull, this is what you're going to see. 
Um, I'm particularly pleased they were able to create an entire exterior path that leads you around the building. And in this really rather complicated project, not only um, have we been able to work closely with everybody at the museum, um, headed by, by Catherine, of course, but our colleagues from LPA and uh, the, the uh, builders uh, level 10 are uh, torturers, GAFCON, the owners, rep and uh, construction managers, and uh, countless intelligent, wonderful people whether that's SGH and Guy Nordensen, our structural engineers. Uh, it has been a complex ride and one uh, that as we see it coming together as being incredibly worthwhile and really exhilarating to see as a place for you all in San Diego. And with that, I thank you. Annabelle, I can tell you the crowd's going wild. They're, uh, <laughs> they're, they're applauding and cheering, and they're also asking questions. And I know we've we've run a little bit long, but I want to um, get some questions in. That's what happens if nobody advances my slides. I just yeah, we give you too much control. Um, but I'm gonna. Uh, I'm really grateful for for that presentation. I think it it helped frame and set up the work that you're doing um, in La Jolla. And I think I'm gonna concentrate on the questions that ask about La Jolla. Um, but I'm going to start by this question where somebody noted when you talked about the Frick, um, and I think it was when you were showing the Bellini painting next to the window so that you, know, you could be looking at this, you know, St. Francis and look out the window and see a modern building. And so the question says, I'm so interested to hear your concept for the Frick renovation of incorporating what's beyond the building to invite it to be into relationship with what's inside and vice versa. Um, and they say, I hope that experience at MCA San Diego will be respected. So that's it just doesn't doesn't quite ask a question, but I, I uh, wonder if you want to address that. Well, in a funny way, I actually think that that you could almost talk about that better than me, uh, because for us, that was a little bit like the mandate. You know, we we New Yorkers came in. And experiencing La Jolla, seeing this incredible view, it almost was like, goes without saying, you have to incorporate that. But I remember early days when we talked about it is that the experience of the place is as important as the experience of a good art gallery sequence, because I think there is no such thing as a neutral space. And you want to be thinking that I'm in La Jolla, I'm looking at this art in this particular place. And, and you want the experience to be unadulterated, but you also want it to be specific. Yeah, it, and I will um, add to that because, um, because I'm the La Jolla in here and it is such a <laughs> thrill to be in the space we, I, I do think we charged you with, with creating a building that was respectful to the village and to the coast. And that's what you delivered. And so when you, when you come into the building, um, you know, we want you to look at the art. We want you to go probably buy things in the store and all of that. But if you turn and, and look out, you see the village framed in really exquisite ways. I mean, there's this sort of architectural framing, we, you know, from, from Russell Forrester to Irving Gill, you see St. James Church, you see the Presbyterian Church, you see the rec center. And these are at different vantages. Um, the Morton Bay fig tree has never looked better. I mean, everybody's, we always love that tree, but now it's it's being hugged by the building. And there's, you know, massive um, wall of windows that, that direct you to a new view of that tree. And then, um, so if that's to the village, when we look to the coast, you, you ended with these very dramatic um, views of the windows that that face coast. So I mean, the the ocean is un, undeniable, but you give us views where we see it in a, a narrow window with a John Baldessari like palm tree, you know, um, 
uh, against the blue sky with, with the blue water below, we see just sky and blue water in some spaces. And then we, we, see, we see the um, cobble wall and beach and others. So um, I have to say that's, that's been a win. <laughs> and, and yet, you know, the other thing I'd look at, of course, is just that there's all these walls and space, space for the collection. Um, there was another question that's related though to San Diego, particularly just if um, the city, if San Diego or La Jolla informed your use of materials in, in any way. Say that again. They ask about um, how San Diego or La Jolla might have informed your choice of materials. Your... Well, I, th I think that's an interesting question because I don't usually think about materials until sort of late in the game. They probably, you think about materials sort of like in your unconscious. But in the first place, we really had to think about how, how, what does the museum do? How does it work? And, and then sort of step by step, as you know all too well, uh, you sort of introduce the materials and see what makes sense. And I think the less you think about materials in a museum such as this one, the better it is. It fits in, it's low key. It's not saying I'm here, but at the same time, there is a kind of appreciation. We have these beautiful travertine panels in the um, in certain elevations and um, they're just a small nod to Louis Kahn at the Salk Institute, but they also make sense here because they sort of provide a kind of um, texture and materiality that that um, is very honorable, I would say. But they're not dominant. They are not uh, standing out. And for example, as you know all too well, the ribs of Sherwood, uh, now Strauss galleries, are going to be articulated so that that the structure of the building is is also present and visible. Yeah. I would say it's not in the first place about materials. It's really much, much more about the space. And the materials are really more about being, being part of a sort of overall tranquil uh, experience. Um, another question that that came about um, in terms of the space. And I think I think the um, person asked this question as you were showing the stairwell in David Zwerner Gallery. So that terrific, you know, ongoing stairwell. And, and they ask, um, you know, if or how one th thinks about acoustics in that case, you know, do does that factor in if you think about, about what how the sound travels in the stairwell or in the gallery, or maybe even just in the site, you know, with with crashing ocean waves and um, talk about sound. <laughs> yeah, sound is such an interesting thing because um, I'm not fond of noise, <laughs> uh, but at the same time, you, you don't want things to be um, overly silent so i think there there there's a sort of middle ground there uh that i don't know how to describe that properly we've had conversations about that in the past i think I can best describe it via the notion of memory. Uh, like oddly enough, I think we memorize spaces in part by sound. And, um, and if I think of this, I would hope um, that there is 
that tranqu the melody of tranquility, the voices of silence um, resonate with you in your memory uh, after after you've been there. Well, and and I um, I feel like oftentimes you you talk about the spaces being in use. You know, you um, so so that that people being near one is part of the experience. I mean, you talked about, when you talked about the David Werner Gallery, you said not just that there's art on the walls, but there's people who work there, you know, or when you talked about the school in Africa, you said it's, it's not just this for the students, it's for the community. So I, I will say for myself, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm eager to hear the sounds of our, of our guests in the gallery, of course. Um, you know, and you have, um, done applied different acoustical considerations for the spaces where that might be more required right you know there's some spaces where we would be having lecturers or events sure. and so then, then you've you've done different types of treatment um let's see somebody else says i kind of like this question it says many contemporary architectures are designing curvilinear or showy buildings uh, your architecture on the other hand is more rectilinear and low key can you comment? <laughs> I can. It makes me laugh because I think um, I've always thought that I'm probably on the boring side. Um, and that was a little bit intimidating for a really long time until I realized I may be boring, <clears throat> but I'm very specifically boring. <laughs> And in this last year of working virtually and only using the Zoom tool on the drawings that I'm exchanging with my colleagues, I can only use fluid lines. And so watch out in the future, it may all be just very round. Now, all joking aside is, uh, I am very interested in balance and proportion in um, in the in an experience that is measured and gestural architecture does something very different something that I am less interested in but I'm also less able to have access to and um, I so admire colleagues who do know how to do that. Uh, but the longer I practice, the more I think that if I can do, if I can achieve significant space with less, uh, with less effort, it kind of propels me further. And I, I can imagine that that um, that quality is one that has allowed you to be so successful in working with with renovations of existing buildings, you know, of of you know, sort of being gracious and accommodating to to the existing sites, you know, from from the Neue Gallery to to us to the Frick. You know, I think it's it's worth noting that you know between the Frick and uh, our museum, you're you're working with hundred year old buildings, you know, and 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 both bringing them to today, but trying to also respect that history. So, and, and when we put out the charge, we did, we were mindful of our own, as I said before, our own architectural history. We didn't want to erase that. We were, uh, I think, mindful of the scale of the village and we didn't want to have a, um, you know, a, some kind of dramatic silhouette. We, we didn't think, you know, on, on our property. And so, so you met our call, I think, through, through your interest in, um, through that boring interest in uh, balance. Um, there, there's some just practical questions folks are saying. Um, somebody's asking if there's a floor plan. I don't think we have that as a, as a slide to put up. Um, no, but we, we didn't. We can look uh, to we make sort of have one on our thought it, would, um, it would get us. We would never end. <laughs> yes. Yeah, we'd never end. But, and, so, and so related, somebody says, when are you gonna open the building? Um, I'll answer that one. Um, our, we're slated to complete construction 
so it's not opening the building, but to complete construction in October of this year. You all have been very patient with us. Thank you. And uh, thanks to the, to the team that's, that's been working to keep us on schedule. So we'll be doing preview events um, as soon as we get take possession of the building, but we won't open to the public until April of 2022. So April 22. Um, a year from now. And then somebody else asked when the Frick will open. So you've got to tell me that it's going to be later than 22. Oh, it is. <laughs> okay. So that's yeah, 2036 or something like that for the Frick, right? 36. Yeah. Uh, I hope I'll make it till then. <laughs> well, we will, we will let uh, the rest of our audience go. I, I appreciate you all staying on so long. We're getting lots of lots of thanks, and um, people are saying that they're, they're, there's more questions. I, I just I know that we're 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 a little pushed for time. Um, I apologize again for speaking for so long. It well, we will um, have other opportunities to to meet with Annabelle as we get closer to to our opening. Yeah. So again, um, on behalf of, of uh, Roxana at SDMA and all of us here at MCA San Diego, thank you for joining us. Thank you, Annabelle, for being our 21st Axline lecturer. It was really such a privilege. Thank you so much. All right. Good night. Good night. <laughs>